Let's face it, James Bond films are sexist. Period. Or at least they were, until actor Daniel Craig came along in 2006 and shaped the role of Britain's most famous spy to match today's world. With every subsequent film, female characters were made stronger, feistier and more independent. With No Time to Die being the first James Bond film released in the post-Me Too era, change was deemed long overdue and necessary. However, a recent interview with the film's director Kari Joji Fukunaga sparked controversy when he referred to Sean Connery's Bond as a rapist, not willing to accept a no from a woman. His comments would come back to haunt him, as he himself apparently tried to pressure actress Raiden Greer into going nude on the set of True Detective. Raiden is here with me today to exclusively reveal the whole story and the impact it had on her. It's no secret that the Bond producers and actor Daniel Craig have worked collaboratively with screenwriters to make the leading ladies in Bond films more important, multifaceted and almost equal to Bond himself. The individual women have repeatedly emphasized that equality in interviews, even refusing to be called a Bond girl like Eva Green did in a 2006 interview with a Vancouver Sun, in which she said, I'm not a Bond girl. I had some interviews yesterday and it pissed me off because they said, so you're the Bond girl and you die just like the others. It's just more balanced, she's an equal match. For the next film, Quantum of Solace in 2008, actress Olga Kurilenko said about her character Camille that she's very strong, almost an equal to Bond, very feisty, has her own mission, independent, she's just a strong woman. Introduced in Skyfall as the new Miss Moneypenny, who gets her share of active field duty in the beginning and middle of the film, actress Naomi Harris stated that her character sees Bond as her equal, but also as someone she admires because he is the ultimate field agent. Bringing the character of Bond to a new emotional level in 2015's Spectre, 007 embarks on a fateful relationship with Madeleine Swann, portrayed by actress Lea Seydoux who stated that it's the first time I think we see a character that's James Bond's equal. She doesn't need him. I think it's a good representation to have a character like this, to see a tough woman who's not just an object of desire. The latest addition to 007's on-screen beauties is Ana de Armas, who also rejects the term Bond girl, saying, I think this movie is Bond women, not so much Bond girls. They're highly skilled, they're powerful, and they all show it in their own way. They're equals to Bond. Times change, and I think that is reflected in the film. Speaking of equality to the hero James Bond, these actresses do have a point. But there have been equals before. It's not new. Think of Anya Amasova in The Spy Who Loved Me, for instance. Barbara Bach portrayed an enemy agent who was capable in seduction and fighting her own battles and even threatened to kill Bond for revenge. I did kill him. Then, when this mission is over, I will kill you. Two years later, Lois Childs played astronaut Holly Goodhead in Moonraker, but behind the cheeky name was a tough leading lady who fought alongside Bond in outer space. At the time of the film's release in 1979, only one woman Russian Valentina Tereshkova had ever been to space. This was a giant leap, pun intended. I am looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. A woman. Your powers of observation do you credit, Mr. Bond. There are many more examples of strong female characters long before producers Barbara Broccoli, Michael G. Wilson and their star Daniel Craig took Bond onto an emotional story arc spanning five films within 15 years. Especially, the latest entry to the world's longest-running film franchise tries to propel the female leads to a new level of politically correct portrayal of women. Long gone are the 1960s where Bond's conquests were nothing more than eye candy, disposable pleasures and sacrificial lambs. According to director Kari Fukunaga, it was an important mission for him to change the world around Bond 
and make female characters more than just contrivances. And then, in a long interview in The Hollywood Reporter's September 2021 issue, he rattled the cage of Bond fans all around the globe by asking, is it Thunderball or Goldfinger, where, like, basically Sean Connery's Bond rapes a woman? She's like, no, 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 and he's like, yes, yes, yes. That wouldn't fly today. The internet was in a frenzy, and it was quickly established which scenes he was referring to. In 1964's Goldfinger, Bond overpowers Pussy Galore, and she clearly turns her head away to evade being kissed. Eventually, she succumbs and embraces him while they share a long kiss. Could she have escaped 007? No doubt she could have. Her knee in his soft parts would have helped resolve the situation. But Bond was always supposed to be a womanizer, someone who uses women and make them do what he wants. Same goes for Thunderball in 1965 and the second scene Kari Fukunaga was referring to. After almost having his spine broken by a traction table in the health retreat, Bond threatens Nurse Patricia to take the incident to the clinic manager, after which she would lose her job. The only way to avoid that is having sex with Bond in the Turkish bath. Well, I... I suppose my silence could have a price. You do mean... Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Although the nurse seems reluctant, she has a faint smile on her lips. Audiences took it for granted, although she vigorously rejected Bond's advances just a couple of minutes earlier when he forced his lips on hers. Behave yourself, Mr. Bond. Whether this is enough evidence to call James Bond a rapist is subject to your own perception. Fukunaga is certainly right in saying this wouldn't fly today. But it's especially this expression in the Hollywood Reporter interview that leaves a bad aftertaste when hearing about the director's own mistreatment of actress Raiden Greer on the set of American TV series True Detective in 2013. Raiden has been starring in films such as The Host, Maggie and Magic Mike XXL, as well as TV series like American Horror Story and NCIS New Orleans. In addition to her acting career, she is a documentary filmmaker with her own production company and also maintains an active YouTube channel where she regularly shares insights on a wide variety of topics. I'm very happy Raiden has taken the time to join me today from the US. Hello, Raiden. Glad to have you with us. Hi, thank you. I'm glad to speak with you today. Carrie Fukunaga's interview in The Hollywood Reporter, where he basically called James Bond a rapist. You must have read that. Otherwise, uh, I can't explain why you went on uh, the Daily Beast, which is a, a news website based in New York, where the story broke on October 13, that you had quite an unpleasant run-in with Kari Fukunaga in 2013, which is now eight years ago. Can you take us through what actually happened on the set of True Detective? And like you said, the Hollywood Reporter article that Carrie did was the thing that brought this all back to the surface for me. Um, but going back to 2013, um, I was hired on True Detective after, you know, what to me was a pretty rigorous, in-depth audition process. I had gone in multiple times. I had improvised at length in my final audition in front of the director and producers. Um, and I was hired on the show to play a character who was a stripper. Um, but although she was a stripper, you know, she had a first and last name. Um, she had a purpose um, for being on the show to move the story along. It was not just, you know, a cut and drive, you know, show up and be a stripper and have nothing to say and nothing to do. So um, I was not expecting to have to do any kind of nudity. Generally, um, it, as it goes in the casting process, generally that information is given before the actor auditions. So on what's the casting breakdown, um, which is like the list of all the characters and little descriptions about what they do, it will say, you know, like simulated sex or 
topless, you know, nudity required or full frontal nudity or whatever it is, it will be disclosed at the outset. So in this case, you know, because the character was a stripper, um, I was a little unsure about what would be expected of me, despite the fact that, um, you know, no indication was given. So I was given repeated assurances by everyone involved, by my agents, by casting. Everyone said, you know, it would have been disclosed. There's no way it would be unheard of if they asked you to do it once you got there. And then, of course, once I got there, I was asked to do it. Um, so I was very unhappy with the situation and the way that it was put to me by Carrie Fukunaga, which was that he specifically told me, you have to be topless. Your character is a stripper. Everyone on this show goes topless. You of all people have to do it. And I was very young. To me, I was very young and inexperienced at the time. You know, I was in my early 20s. I just couldn't believe the inhumanity with which it was handled. I was never treated like a human being that would, you know, reasonably feel uncomfortable with this situation. It was put to me, you know, you have to do this and that's all there is to it. Nobody cared, you know, how I felt about it or even the the morality or the professionalism that they were not um, employing in the situation. You know, the fact was that I felt like I should have been given a choice and I should have been given a choice. I should have been allowed to make my own decision about whether or not I wanted to appear nude on this show. So um, I believe that Carrie and the producers thought that I would go along with it, that I would be able to be easily coerced um, because I was young and because I was advanced and I didn't. I said, I'm going to do it. So we'll figure out some other way to shoot it. Um, I'm not doing it. So whenever I said that I wasn't doing it, then as like kind of a last ditch effort, I was offered, well, you could wear nude pasties, but you need to appear nude. And I said, no, that's not what we agreed on whenever I accepted this role. And appearing nude is the same to me as being nude. And none of it was negotiated. None of it was uh, built into my contract. None of this is above board. This is not the way you do this. Um, but I never imagined that I would be fired for that. But of course I was fired. Um, I went back to my trailer to wait for several hours. Then they came back and said, you know, we're giving the part to somebody else. Um, so it was a completely unprecedented situation for me that I never expected. I mean, I didn't even think it was possible that someone could fire you from your job for not getting naked. But, you know, bringing it back to the Hollywood Reporter article, um, that was pretty, you know, it was like a slap in the face all over again to read these, you know, <laughs> the the feminist, you know, kind of errors that were being put on, I felt by the director in the article, because I, I think the part that I read, it wasn't the bond as a rapist thing. It was the, um, where he said that he had taken, like gone to great lengths to flesh out the female characters and to make them more than just contrivances, which I thought was kind of the ultimate irony, considering that I was reduced to such an insignificant piece of this production that if I'm not willing to be topless, even though you didn't go about it in the professional way, you should go getting nudity for a character on your show. Um, that's what it all came down to in my situation, which is kind of, you know, the opposite of the woke feminist uh, image that he was trying to portray mm -hmm. and also back to your other the other part of your question about do I think anything has changed no I don't think anything has changed the interview to me read it completely disingenuous on his part and that's what kind of upset me to the point that I wanted to finally tell this story that no one had ever really cared about since 2013 um because I do think it's it's pandering it's it's what he feels he needs to do to make his box office numbers 
um, to make the box office of the film a success. I don't think it's a genuine feeling that he has. I think it's it's just let's do what we have to do, say what we feel we need to say to placate people. And that's exactly how it came across to me. Hmm. I uh, did get the same feeling from it. And I, I know the two text pieces you were referring to, the contrivance part. And uh, for me, uh, the Bond part also applies because uh, he says, um, a woman clearly says no to Bond. Uh, she says, no, no, no. And he says, yes, yes, yes. Well, you in on the set in March 2013 on True Detectives, you were the one who said no. And he was the one who said, yes, yes, yes. And also he said that wouldn't fly today, what Bond did in the 60s. Well, I, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't fly today what he did on the set of True Detectives, especially not after the whole Me Too, Harvey Weinstein thing. Um, and now we're in the post era of that. So uh, I would really find it difficult to uh, have a director like that with a, a backstory. And now I would call it a backlash like this. Well, you know, I think it's pretty telling, too, that nobody has made any comment about um, me coming out with my story. And I'm I'm aware that the story took off in a way after it came out in a way that I was not really anticipating. But I mean, it reached you, obviously. Um, it reached a great many people who in turn reached out to me on social media or You know, I've even had people come tell me other stories about this director, about, you know, different things that they've heard or that they've experienced personally. But, you know, I know that, for example, the reporter at the Daily Beast reached out to Fukunaga's reps and reached out to HBO and nobody will say anything. I have ironclad proof that HBO is aware of the situation that happened with me in 2013. They know what happened. They know that what I'm saying is true, but nobody wants to comment, um, presumably because they know it's true. And what can you say? Yes, uh, my actions are completely at odds with the uh, the persona that I'm putting forth in the promotion of this film. Yeah, you can't say that. So, you know, I, I don't know uh, what his true feeling is today, of course, um, but I think it's pretty telling that no one has said anything. Yes, absolutely. And absolutely, uh, the the rules have changed uh, for uh, that actors and actresses don't experience what you experienced on the set. I think in 2020, uh, the Screen Actors Guild introduced new rules that uh, writers have to be put in a contract 48 hours before when you go nude or have sex scenes. Um, do you think this is a step in the right direction? And is it enough? Or does there need to be more? Yes, I think that things have improved. But even as far back as 2013, it was still unheard of to do what he did. People still were given nudity writers back then. Commonly, people were given nudity writers. It just wasn't given to me. Whatever reason, you know, actually, my agent at the time in 2013 said that she had a male actor who was booked on the show who was given the nudity writer. But it wasn't given to me. And I don't know if it has. I can't speculate on what the reason was, but I think at the at its core, yes, we can continue to make strides as far as, you know, SAG after guidelines and whatever else. But at the end of the day, I think the most important change we have to make is on a fundamental level of how women are viewed by men in positions of power on these sets, because we know that men in positions of power film set can get away with a lot of things. And it doesn't necessarily matter. It's not as important to me, the, the guidelines that place because those systems can fail us. And especially when we're still caught in this system, you know, where It's been a boys club. Men are allowed to do whatever they want to do. It wasn't just the director on the True Detective set that was complicit in this choice to fire me rather than to just treat me with respect, like I was a valued part of the production and that I was bringing something to the table. The producer 
officers, everybody, all of these other men who were there were also complicit. And it was, there has to be like a, you know, it can't just be something that we do to placate people and then continue to, to do the same things. That's why I'm so bothered by the fact that I don't think there's been any real change. I think that on a surface level, there are people who are who say things and you know want to put forth this image of yes we're making progress we're doing better but at its core i'm really not sure that that's the case Mm, okay has this ever happened to you on other productions or has it happened to actresses that you met at these productions since 2013 i've told this story to pretty much everybody everyone who knows me knows this story because I've been upset about it since 2013. I've told it since 2013. And usually when I tell people about it, they're shocked. They can't believe it happened to me. Other actors that I've told it to have said, you know, uh, you know, I, there are a lot of actors who have never been fired, period. Um, but to be fired for, you know, not doing nudity that was they were trying to coerce you to do in the 11th hour no i've never met anyone that that's happened to although um i have read stories about a daily b story about um i think they referenced evangeline Lilly, where she talked about being coerced into doing nudity on a set you know it does happen i know that it happens um it's very unfortunate but I'm sure I'm not the only person it's had. That being said, I've never been treated like that on any other set. And it certainly didn't throw you off the path of, of being an actress and continuing in that business. Well, I mean, it was very disheartening. It was very upsetting, you know, just to know how little everyone involved thought of me, you know, like, okay, well, it was just... It was unbelievable to me at the time. And it was, like I said, disheartening. Um, mm-hmm. But even back then, you know, I was I'm a pretty resilient person. I don't know if another woman in my position, I feel like 90 percent of women in my position who were inexperienced, just starting out in their careers, wanting this job probably would have just been coerced and would have just done it, even though it's not right. Um, but. For me, I feel like the the weight of the situation didn't even really hit me until after the Me Too movement began, because it is one of those situations where you're always questioning, like, well, did I do something? You know, like, is it my fault? Like, was I, you know, and then after my story came out, people largely have been very supportive and nice, but there have still been people who say things to me like, you knew what you were getting yourself into. The character was a stripper. You don't understand. It's not about that. It's about the way that my choice was taken away and then I was fired from my job for not getting naked. It's, (laughs) again, though, there are still people that don't understand why this is wrong, unfortunately. But yeah, I I would say just my resilience as a human being enabled me to continue. Um, But it is, it's a difficult business to be involved in for sure. But you uh, run your own uh, production company and you are a documentary filmmaker, I understand. Can you tell us something about your project? Yes, I actually I've been working on a documentary since 2018 that actually has to do with um, the industry and the way that it can be uh, for people who play smaller roles. Uh, Actually, the truth of the matter is that, um, you know, there's a lot of controversy right now about crew and the way that crew are um on sets and on low budget sets especially with everything that happened with alec baldwin and rust um but another truth about this is that 99.5 percent of actors are treated badly as well and you have you know uh 0.05% of actors who are the top 0.05% who are treated like royalty. But, 
it's not that way for 99.5% of the rest of us. Um, actually, the vast majority of actors that are members of Screen Actors Guild don't even earn a living in a, any given year. The vast majority just don't earn a living. And it's a very difficult business uh, for those who are playing, you know, the the character who's a stripper for one episode on True Detective or, you know, it has a lot to do with the nuance of uh, the way people are treated across um, the spectrum of the business. Um, but it's centered around my dad, who was also an actor. Um who got me into the the business for better or worse. Um, and then I'm also working on a, a short documentary about a historically black 100 year old neighborhood um, in Arkansas, which is where I'm from. Um, and the town where I'm from is was historically segregated. And there are a lot of things that have changed and a lot of things that haven't. And I'm focusing on the past, present, and future of this neighborhood that still needs a lot of help. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak to us today and uh, tell your story. I think it is very, very important that these stories get out. And I hope uh, it uh, challenges more actresses to come forward with stories that they have and uh, give this Me Too movement another boost so that the industry can change. And um, as we established, they are on a good path, but more things need to be done. And um, I just wanted to do my part in giving you this platform to tell us the story in connection with Kerry Fukunaga's comments. And uh, that's why I thank you very much for this interview, Raiden. Thank you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it, actually. You know, I was disturbed by the fact that, you know, the story caught fire for a couple of days, about a week, and then no one commented and then it just went away. So, you know, I feel like I did my part by speaking up at all, but absolutely, there's more work to be done. Absolutely. Well, if you liked uh, Raiden's comments and uh, if you have something to say, please express it in the comments and uh, I will forward everything to you, Raiden, uh, what the users say and maybe the video will appeal to a large audience. That's what I'm hoping for. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is by far not the first time interview comments have produced a backlash. The same happened to first James Bond actor Sean Connery, who had this to say in a November 1965 Playboy interview. I don't think there is anything particularly wrong about hitting women, although I don't recommend doing it in the same way that you'd hit a man. An open-handed slap is justified if all other alternatives fail, and there has been plenty of warning. If a woman is a bitch, hysterical or bloody-minded continually, I'd do it. 22 years later, journalist Barbara Walters openly confronted Sean Connery about his comment, resulting in a legendary interview bit that is still hard to watch today. Here it is. Years ago, you did an interview, which may come back to haunt you. What, you know what I'm going to say, right? No. Okay. You did an interview in which you said, uh, not the worst thing to slap a woman now and then. As I remember, you said you don't do it with a clenched fist. It's better to do it with an open hand. Mm. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't love that. I haven't changed my opinion. You haven't? No, not at all. You think it's good to slap a woman? No, I don't think it's good. I you don't think, think it's bad? It must, I don't think it's that bad. I think that it depends entirely on the circumstances and if it merits it. Yeah. Well, what would merit it? Well, if you have tried everything else, and women are pretty good at this, they, they can't leave it alone. Yeah? They don't they want to have the, the, the last word, and you give them the laugh, last word, but they're not happy with the last word. They want to say it again and, and get into a really provocative situation. Then I think it's absolutely right. To give her a good slap? Yeah, absolutely. What if she gives you a good slap back? Well, then you get into another area. I mean, uh, then maybe she's getting to like it, and then it becomes something else, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, I, seriously, I think that uh, it's the last resort. He's not going to do it because he wants to do it. Huh? Wait till people see this interview. Are you going to get mail? 
Might get some female. <laughs> there you have it. We heard about a lot of things that wouldn't fly today, if I may quote Bond director Kari Fukunaga one last time. And before the film industry goes through great lengths in alerting us to any injustices, I think it would probably be wise to first make sure that stories like we just heard from actress Raiden Greer don't repeat themselves. Wake up, Hollywood. There's lots more to be done. Benjamin Lind for the Bond Bulletin. Thank you for watching.